Uh, I can quickly go through, um, how are these gonna advance? Click, okay, forgive the technical difficulties. All right, so, you know, very brief intro because most of you already know me. Uh, a brief primer on ecological principles just to like synchronize our swatches on like, you know, what constitutes decent bird habitat. It's much bigger than just birds, right? Spoiler alert. Um, let's look a little bit about, look into Philadelphia ecosystems, Philadelphia bird communities, where we could bird, and uh, then look a little bit about, uh, look into ecological stewardship. Um, and then I have some slides here about the hillside project at Laurel Hill Cemetery, because that's what this was about. And we could disregard the great backyard bird count. Hopefully you guys did participate. Um, but, uh, you know, that's, it's, uh, that's, that's a goner. So uh, here's me, um, you know, local guy, Philadelphia, Delaware County, my whole life. I briefly lived in the Pine Barrens, um, but uh, Delco drew me back. Um, local, everything, Drexel University for the undergrad. I got my master's degree at Penn. Um, been a DVOC member for 16 years, I think now. It's adding up. Crazy. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the banders in charge for the, the Saw It Out project at Willistown. I'm also on the board there with a bunch of other DVOC members including Dr. Weinstein. Uh, most importantly, daddy, you know, gotta be daddy first. Um, and uh, I've had the great pleasure of uh, teaching ornithology at Penn and uh, an ecosystems class for the Masters of Landscape Architecture at Temple in recent years. Um, I work for, I used to work for uh, AES, it was an ecological restoration firm. We were bought by a bigger ecological restoration firm called RES, this is their mission and stuff. Um, they do large scale ecological restoration. A lot of it's tied to mitigation. So it's like this bridging the gap between, you know, industrial stuff and like, you know, economic advancement, the offsets to do ecological restoration. For example, like the turnpike is going to impact 15.01 acre wetlands by expanding a lane. We'll proactively understand that, find a space that makes sense and do a 10 acre wetland versus a bunch of real little ones that have a more meaningful Actual, like actual mitigation versus like these little one-offs where we put a fence around it and it turns into a fragmented pit that nobody, uh, birds or people can enjoy. And uh, they get some pretty heavy stats, you know, millions of trees planted, you know, 600 miles of stream in the United States that's been restored, a whole bunch of cool stuff. So I, I enjoy the work I do. So um, this is where birding and avifaunal ecology me, I know every one of you in here and listening, and if you haven't yet, you will if you keep birding, um, you, you know by experience that birds are phenomenal indicators of ecosystem conditions. And I have two birds up here, right? Tyrannus tyrannus and uh, Betrania long, longicata, which you'll be looking for at the jump circle uh, in Lakehurst. You know, if you close your eyes and just listen to birds in the spring, I don't care where you are in the world, depending on your knowledge, but let's just say in the Northeast of the United States, and you listen to the chorus of birds, you very likely can paint the landscape exactly where you are. Whether you're in a meadow, you're in a, in a, an edgy, in a field, you can even estimate how fallow that field is, whether, you know, the successional state of that field, whether you're deep in the woods, whether it's a conifer forest, whether it's a hardwood forest. Um, you know, for example, an Eastern Kingbird, if you hear an Eastern Kingbird, you know, they're relatively resourceful, right? I mean, but typically they're going to be on the edge of a forest. Their home ranges always require some sort of open field type component. So what you hear alongside that bird is going to really enforce where you're at, right? Um, and uh, obviously with a, with an upland sandpiper, you, you know, you're probably standing in a pretty cool grassland. Depending on what else you hear, you know, if you hear a Sprague's pippet too, guess what? You're not in Pennsylvania, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you hear savanna sparrows, and grasshopper sparrows, you might be in New Jersey, you know? Um, but anyway, uh, oh, another good example, cerulean warbler, right? If you hear a cerulean warbler, not always, but it's very likely that you're in a hardwood forest. You're probably at the top of a hill or on the north facing slope on the music side, and there's going to be small gaps in that in in that canopy by one tree dying from a lightning strike or something. Females uh, will not uh, use a nest typically unless it's lined with vitus bark. And they peel strips of vitus bark and line the top of it, so you know you're going to be in a in a relatively mature hardwood canopy, probably on the north facing. Right, you can get really specific about where you are based on the birds. 
And that's because they're, they have certain requirements and they're not going to be there if those requirements are not, right? And just like anything else, some species are way more adaptive. If you just hear a song sparrow, good luck guessing where you're at, right? It's pretty resourceful. Um, but, uh, you know, and it gets down to very, very habitat specific species. So um, this is something I love about the work that I do. Um, I never assess a landscape without including birds. And it's very easy to justify that. Not only do I love it, bird watch, but uh, I can really interpret the landscape rapidly. It's good for bioblitz, right? You know, like for example, I just recent, recently won the great privilege is a new master plan for Green Lane Reservoir. And I'm on the design team for that as the lead ecologist. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna have two years and $700,000 to do some robust study, but we did align it. So I'm gonna have spring migration, breeding birds, fall migration. I'm also gonna be you know, looking for mammals and having camera traps. I'm gonna be calling annual surveys. I've already done some salamander studies. But th those bird studies, especially during the breeding season, are gonna tell me a whole lot about the habitat that's present and its functionality. So um, that's gonna give us a lot of guidance on how to move forward with interpreting the landscape, providing meaningful recommendations to improve the avifaunal ecology, which as often umbrella species, everything underneath that's gonna benefit from it. So, um, and by the way, I'm very likely to, to go long tonight. So, um, you know, I'll try to breeze over some of the, some things and I will probably wax poetically about some others. Um, so we're going to just do this this little exercise. For anyone who's seen the, my presentation before, you may have seen this before, so I apologize in advance. But um, here's two images shamelessly pilfered from the internet. They look like they're some European wildflower meadows of some sort. Um, you can you can all read that that uh, that statement there that you know wildlife is dependent upon specific elements within the landscape, both biotic and abiotic. So determining presence or absence of target wildlife, i.e. birds, right? Great uh, indicators of ecosystem functionality. We can diagnose the functionality without having to do all these different taxes specific, often costly or destructive studies to interpret what's going on there. So for example, you know, these two look pretty similar, but that one's got a tree line, a hedgerow with some trees. That's a predator perch. If you know about grassland birds, that's a zone of inhibition, right? You need core interior habitat. So if these are both 60 acres, the one is going to have more core suitable breeding habitat for grassland birds, the one without the hedgerow, versus the other one. Now, if you're in an area where blue grosbeak and brown thrasher are of interest, then it might be really important to have that hedgerow present. But either way, that's no structure that's worth interpreting. Um, all, all the life as we know it is probably can be simplified to the relationship of insects and plants. And I've, I've done whole presentations on just that, the, uh, the arms race between herbivory, the tricks that plants create, right? A, 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 a taste or something that'll get you stoned or make you sick to slow down herbivory. And then that caterpillar figures out something in their gut content to, to beat that and the tricks. Without that, we wouldn't have spices, right? We wouldn't, you know, the, the, all, literally the spice of life wouldn't, wouldn't exist. Plant, this drives diversity. So um, understanding the life histories of plants, right? Not just being able to identify, right? You know, a competent botanist you go out and determine all the species that are present, but what are the, what's the relationship to the insects? And then what are the, those insects relationships to things that eat insects, right? Other insects, frogs, birds, et cetera. Um, the configuration, the spatial configuration, the two things that are 60 acres, one is a big circle and one is a long, narrow strip. It's going to have different functionality. You can see in this one, there's mode edges of it's all grass on either side. So the configurations are different. Something to think about looking at your non flowering plants and think about those relationships that aren't happening right before you, but will happen later in the season within that same landscape, because often you won't be able to revisit the same location over and over. Is there water present? This one looks like there's a little bit of pooling on the one side. Water obviously is important. I don't have to explain why, but I think there's a whole new world of uh, uh, taxa that, are, that can be present based on hydrology. And this is a really, really important one, how things are managed, right? I mean, if you live in an area where you have a lawn and you decide to mow it, that's a management decision. You're making an actionable management decision for, for your landscape that has an effect on everything that, that may or may not rely on it. So in this one, if this is mowed in June, here's a photo of a bobolink and a Northern Black racer that I took both of those species would suffer 
significantly, talking about destruction of a nest, potentially, if you're mowing at the wrong time, uh, or physical, you know, if a, a racer or another snake can't get away from the mower, it's going to get chopped up. Box turtles is the plight of box turtles, sadly. Um, and then soils. Soils are like everything. And so he, this is a frosted elfin, you know, one, one of many moth species that rely on um, a good thatch layer and then, you know, the, the soil beneath to, to have a cocoon to overwinter to complete their annual cycle. So just going through some basics, you know, simple ways to look at the landscape instead of just walking in there and pulling out the binoculars and just thinking about birds. I encourage you to try and think about the connections greater if you, if you don't already. And then again, here's another real basic about ecology, right? Food, shelter, water, mates, places to raise young or nest. These things are all critical and everything you do within the landscape affects these relationships. That means the way that we manage our parks, whether we decide to mow areas or retire them. What does retiring them look like? Are we stewarding that to be a warm season grass meadow? Are we stewarding it to be, are we not stewarding it at all? And it's just going to become knotweed and mugwort, right? These, these things are important. Um, not going to go heavy into this. This is just further re-emphasization of the fact that, you know, all these things are connected. It really starts with soils and plants. I'm going to hammer in on that more. And frankly, things beyond soils and plants, right? The reason I think this is important to express for any urban group or like talking about birding or herping or botanizing in the city is restoration at this scale is absolutely critical. Thinking about how to just improve soil health, leave, allowing things to decay in situ um, so we can have proper invertebrates and all those things that we're not looking at, many people aren't looking at. Very, how many people in here are entomologists? I see no hands raised. How many people know some entomologists? Right, we a couple of probably a lot of us probably know the same ones, right? Um, so the very few people. It's so specious, it's so complex, it's an amazing world that's literally happening beneath our feet, and it's absolutely critical to the survival of the things that we care about that are bigger and more showy and sing in front of us or put on a pretty breeding plumage or like to bask on a log. So the, at this level, it's really important to consider restoration. Um, and. Uh, Again, this is something I won't go too into, but root exudates are really like the nectar of the subsurface world, right? There's just all these amazing interactions and relationships that are just as complex as the ones that we have the privilege of viewing above ground, but it's, it's with single-celled and, you know, multi-celled, but really simple organisms. Uh, you know, roots will spit out a little bit of acid, a little bit of oxygen, maybe a little bit of water, um, sugars, right? They're, they're, they're making these deals below ground that are absolutely important. And some of them, it's allelopathy, right? Black walnuts don't play well with others. They spit out poison and say, get the F out of my little grove, right? They don't, they don't like to share. Um, and you guys all heard of this by now, right? The wood wide web. Has anyone here read Suzanne Simard's Finding the Mother Trees? If you haven't, please do. Um, for a number of reasons, women in science um, and, you know, just uh, empirical data proving this thing that people thought about, but and in the face of like one of the toughest, most masculine energy, you know, the logging industry, right? She proved like, hey, you guys are wasting money. You could make billions more if you just paid attention to what's happening underground. You know, these plants are talking to each other, they're supporting each other. If you cut these alders because you think they're gonna steal the water from these little spruce trees you get planted, and you wanna harvest 30 years from now, they're not gonna survive. If you allow them to, you know, have the roots to connect through mycorrhizae, through fungal connections, they're going to talk to each other. They're going to support each other. So, you know, it's it's just again, just extremely humbling is is the goal here, right? Be be amazingly humbled at how um, how little we know about uh, the world beneath us and how important it is, frankly, for for everything above it. All right, so um, talking about Philly and birding. We know a lot of the great spots. I've seen many of you at all of these places, right? John Hines National Wildlife. What an amazing place. You know, most of South Philly looked like sections of John Hines National Wildlife Refuge, the Wekiko Marsh, when indigenous Americans were here many, many thousands of years ago, was a terribly productive space. Right now it's South Philly. Um, so, you know, uh, Penny Pack in the Delaware is a spot where you can have the tidal influx and, and see a combination of a mowed lawn, which mimics some open grassland stuff in migration, 
Um, great place to see a shorted owl on top of a landfill next to a bald eagle nest, right? I mean, so, so birds are terribly adaptive, but you know, great for white winged gulls and other things uh, uh, at the right times of year. The WIS, right? There's so many good birding places in, in the WIS. That's where the rich people live. So there's bigger, older trees, right? So there's amazing, there's still really good woods left in that area. Um, our, ge our geologic history is absolutely phenomenal here in Philadelphia. We'll talk a little bit about it. Cemeteries are phenomenal, right? Laurel Hill, the Woodlands, Mount Moriah, but there's others too. Um, the Biopond is just this magical little space. Why is it so good, right? Um, some of that is related, it's just its geographic location and, uh, you know, the combination of plants there and a few other things. Navy Yard Circuit and the Delaware River watching, going up and down the Delaware River. I think that's really an unexploited resource. We're learning the hard way that one of the reasons there isn't more restoration there, one is economic pressure, but there are champions like the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation that are investing in ecological restoration. Has anyone been to Washington Avenue Pier? Anyone, right? It's a, it's a postage stamp, right? But it's completely de novo. It's, you know, it was, it was Philly's Ellis Island. It was this robust, big, rectangular uh, port where that was the immigration port in Philadelphia a long, long time ago. And, uh, and then there was like a, a, a button making factory there. So you could find like abalone shells with holes drilled in them and stuff. Um, it's gone through all these iterations, but it's just a non natural jut out into the river. But so I had the great pleasure of design. Actually, I saw Tracy Cohen on here, which she was actually the lead designer for this when we worked together at AES. Um, but I had the great pleasure of doing studies. It's a de novo landscape. So we're like, what's the, what's going to be important here, right? We're not going to recreate something. There's no reference natural area for this, right? But it's really important for birds and migration moving along this area. So let's provide food. Let's provide structure, right? Let's not be... Uh, Hardcore native, um, and I'm, by the way, I'm, I push nothing but native plants. But there, there's some mulberry trees and some colonia trees that provided some canopy cover. We left them, we left some up, and planted a bunch of native trees underneath. It's been eight years. They're starting to get tall enough, and they get once they get tall enough, we can cut those trees and replace the canopy instead of just nuking everything from the start. Right? Lots of berry producing shrubs. Uh, and lots of uh, warm season grasses, lots of wildflowers. We found skinks there. There's nesting skinks. So we, the, we, the design of the the the, uh, the the benches, right? We found all these old bricks. Tracy and uh, and Sandy on the design team came up with this great idea to create these cages, preserving those bricks within them. But we made sure there was space between them, so it was great habitat, structural habitat for northern five-line skinks. If you ever saw. The big course we need to be the logs that are uh, bolted to the ground because we don't want people kicking them into the river because that's critical nesting habitat. That's where the skates are nesting, they're laying eggs inside the rotten wood. And you know, Delaware River Waterfront Corp knows that once they rot out enough, we're going to start bothering the hell out of them to find another log to jam in there to, to continue that, right? So these intimate relationships, being adaptive and working with what we've got. I photographed a young of year northern black rat snake that had a big bolus. And right next to it was a very angry song sparrow in a Sambucus canadensis that we planted. The nest is there. There's two chicks in the nest. There's an angry mom or dad right there, not sexually dimorphic, so I don't know which one it was. And then here's this, this rat snake that just ate one of the nestlings. That is a high level of trophic interaction for a South Philly non-native little jut, right? So, um, have faith, like we, we can really do a lot to risk. And you know, the black rat snakes, you know, where'd that rat snake come from? There was a pile of mulch for two years ago then, the egg probably, there's probably eggs laid in that mulch pile that someone forgot to use, right? So the nature's resilient. If we plan for it, we can really support these things. Um, did I say I'd get tangential? <laughs> um, all right, so let's look at the county as a whole. Wow, that's a lot of impervious surface, isn't it? Right, we are truly urbanized. Our county is the city limits. A lot of others, look, we're what, the fifth largest city? Um, you know, Miami and Houston, all those other places, they incorporate counties around them. We don't do that. If we added Bucks and Delco alone in Montgomery County, like we probably ramp up a little more. This is just the city limits. Very, very, very impervious. And that line is my crude interpretation of the, the, the fall line, right? Everything to the, to the south and to the east is the intercoastal plain physiographic province. Deep sands, right? 
Everything to the north and west is the Piedmont physiographic province. This is the basement rock of the Appalachian, the Allegheny in Orogeny, the Appalachian Orogeny. These are the oldest mountain ranges on the planet. We're talking about one point some billion year old rock that we have the great pleasure of living on and burning in. So uh, luckily there are still some green spaces. Fairmount Park is one of the biggest city park systems in the country. Absolutely amazing that we have that resource. Um, so we, ha we have some forests, um, but not a lot. And uh, really, I think the best way to look at the city, if you're like, hmm, if you're not from around here, you just want to redefine your birding experience, is to break it down by watersheds, right? So the Delaware River is our border to the, to the east and south. But we got these five drainages, really, that, that are, they're all draining down to the Delaware River. And so the first is Cobbs, Cobbs Creek and Lower Darby Creek, right? This flows into John Hines National Wildlife Refuge. Within this corridor, there's only six eBird hotspots. You can believe that, right? Only six eBird hotspots, but more than 300 bird species. John Hines is a ringer, right? Um, so there's a lot of good birding on the border of Delco and West Southwest Philly. I'm uh, partial to that being a Delco boy. In fact, when I first met Tony Crosdale, the guy who drug me into being a TDOC member, um, he told me to meet him at John Hines. I pulled up off of 420, Tannic on that little parking area. And wait, I'm like, where the hell is this guy? And he calls me. He's like, dude, where you at? I'm like, I don't know. Where are you? He's like, I'm at Hines. I'm like, no, you're not. I'm here. He's like, dude, there's a whole ass building. And like, but I didn't even know. I literally didn't know. I just knew the Delco entrance from riding a bike there when I was a kid, you know? Um, so, but, you know, there's a lot of ecological restoration that has occurred along Cobb Street. Again, the Plug and Tony and Philly Parks and Rec and the Water Department, uh, Cobbs Creek. Uh, Community Environmental Education Center. Um, there's a highly contentious thing going on right now with the uh, implementation of a master plan for a golf course. Silver lining, guys, there's going to be a huge wetland and stream restoration as a part of that. It better continue to be a part of that because that's going to be a saving grace. A lot of mature trees were lost, mature oaks and hickories, and that's, that's a tough blow. Um, but the, the plan for the stream restoration is going to remove, I don't know how many tons of legacy sediments and increase the stormwater holding capacity. Many, many neighborhoods, underserved neighborhoods flood along this corridor. The stormwater holding capacity should be significant and it should be a win-win. This is going to create uh, floodplain wetlands that will hopefully support marsh wrens and Sora, and Virginia rail. And, you know, let's keep going, right? Flycatchers and yellow warblers, et cetera, et cetera. Should be good functional habitat. So, you know, the, the forever optimist in me is holding on to that, hopefully being something that we can um, enjoy as a, as a functional improvement to this, to this area. But it's, you know, it is at the uh, expense of a, of a pretty significant upland forest. How toxic is the sediment that we're moving? I don't know, I've, I'm not involved in it, but uh, the, the sediment is probably, Probably has, I mean, I, what's the farming legacy, right? I mean, but you, you took, you're looking at soil loss up watershed for, you know, 100 plus years. So um, it depends on what industries are there, et cetera. There's prop, you know, we're finding these uh, PFAS things in everywhere, right? So there's, I mean, it's probably going to be toxins, right? It's on the border of West Philly and, and Upper Darby. So, you know, we'll see. Um, but uh, yeah, so, but only 60 bird hotspots. Now, this is the biggest watershed in the city, right? The Schuylkill, which includes Wissahickon. Um, most of, Fairmount Park is defined by being on one side or the other, right? So it tells you the lion's share of Fairmount Park is within this watershed. Um, <clears throat> we got the widest forested sections in the city are in the Wiss. Um, when it reaches the coastal plain, it's dramatically different. Right. I mean, you, yes, we got Bartram's Gardens. We have a couple cool little natural areas, but it's really a strong industrial legacy and high density, low income housing throughout the, the lower portion of the Schuylkill, including where my dad's neighborhood. You know, so they were called the Schuylkill River Rats. You can shoot arrows at each other because they're dumbasses. But, you know, <laughs> really little pocket parks and just, you know, hardly any trees. Right. Um, there's, I think, a huge opportunity for restoration in the lower end, in the in the uh, intercoastal plain, the lower end of the Schuylkill, right? We have that huge, 
explosion at the refinery and stuff. What's happening with those spaces? Like we, you know, some of these challenges are bigger than than we could tackle um, as one person, but collectively, if we look at these things, there's significant opportunity. Like there's there's real there's spaces that are left that aren't aren't uh, once you build houses, once you build schools, there's no going back, right? Um, you know, I just recently completed a three year study of the Lower Buffalo River area uh, area of concern in Buffalo. And it's the same thing, right? You know, you, there's, there's grain elevators, there's project housing, there's little pockets of, you know, almost look suburban, like little fishing communities along the, the Buffalo River. There's all this dynamism. Some things can change and some things can't, right? The Superfund sites, actually, they're treating them like grasslands now. They, everything is capped and there's breeding savanna sparrows on them. It's not great, right? You got to like, cap a bunch of horrible stuff, but the, but the top of it is supporting savanna sparrows. There's little pockets where, you know, Tesla bought this one area and it broke my heart because they had the only pocket wetlands left. And they have breeding woodcocks and savanna sparrows and salamanders. There's uh, shorthead garter snakes, all this cool stuff. Nothing that would have prevented them from buying and developing that. But we pestered the hell out of them and they gave us a buffer and allowed, they said, look, if you want to come up with the funding to, to manage that as a natural area, have at it. And there's, there's a couple, there's a couple, uh, Savannah Spire territories, they're still breeding salamanders and short egg garbage. We didn't lose it all, right? So hopefully we can, um, that's that's a place where I see opportunity within within an industrial space. And, uh, you know, obviously um, the WIS is pretty amazing. We need to hold on to the places we have. There's a huge amount of ecological restoration that we can do within the spaces that are still great. Carpenter's Woods is amazing, but there's invasive species that could be contended, right? And so uh, working with, um, the city talking to folks like Max Blaustein, hey Max, um, you know, to, to earmark native plants to be planted in these areas to restore missing structure, right? Younger trees, shrub diversity, uh, I think is really important for to, to increase the quality of our habitat for, for breeding birds and my, migratory birds. This is, uh, someone mentioned Robin Irizarry. This is, every time I think of this watershed, I think of Robin um, he's the one who said this to me, the place so nice, they named it Thrice, right? The Tukaneet, the Coney, Frankfurt drainage. Uh, again, uh, this is a highly urbanized area. The I mean, CSO outfalls that would make you stagger occur here, right? I'm the largest in the city. So there's a lot of poo flowing through this water uh, anytime it rains. So uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. The, the group that he used to work with, um, TTF, you know, they're, they're doing a great job trying to steward some of the natural areas that are still present, um, but there's a lot of opportunity. And this is in a really densely populated part of the city. You know, there's only three eBird hotspots here. I saw, I got my life ash started fly catcher along here, you know, 10 years ago or whatever. Like there's good birding to be had and there's good accessibility. This is a great place to bring Philadelphia because there's so many neighborhoods that touch this, this watershed. So I think we need to think a little more creatively about putting some efforts into ecological restoration and stewardship of natural areas uh, within this watershed. And then uh, this is the penny pack. I'm not a Northeast boy. I got a bunch of family, a bunch of redheaded, half toothless McGraws that live up in the Northeast, but I'm a Delco kid. Um, but, uh, you know, Tony's drug me out. Tony and his dad have drug me out to plenty of good spots here. Um, there's great birding to be had. Again, only 60 bird hotspots within the penny pack. That's uh, kind of surprising to me, but there's some really good locations, right? Uh, you got penny pack park, the, the northern and southern ends are, are real good. And there's some good forested areas in between as well. Um, the floodplain delta, has anybody, um, well, there's penny pack in Delaware, right? So there's you know, good stuff down below. Again, highly populated part of the city. It's a great way to, to, um, create some, some good access and, uh, you know, the fact that there is some forested part or present, I think we could build on, we could improve habitat and birds that are migrating through, we could, we could probably convince more to stick around. And I, I've never birded anything in the Pressing Creek. Anybody here? Yeah? Cool. Great. Any, uh, you know, there's only, there's four eBird hotspots, over 200 species that are currently documented. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I guess technically I have them. Benjamin Rush is at the other end. Gotcha. You know, it looks at you know the the Mud Island area. You know, it looks like there's probably some some good some good birding opportunities there. So, but again, like I don't know a ton about that area, but 
So, that, I mean, there's the five drainages. Like, so if you want to, like, I think it would be fun for us as a group, maybe to, to organize, like, even like some, some, some healthy competition, right? Like by watershed, like by watershed on a given day or like teams that hit each watershed, but keep, keep species listed or separate or something, right? Just to try and boost exposure and, and uh, familiarity with these, with the, the city um, across its uh, countywide. So this I'm not going to go too heavy in on, but uh, I mean, this is something important to look at, right? Here's, an, here's your average snapshot. This is just a Google map snapshot. This is somewhere, I think, in Grace Ferry. I used to live at 23rd and Kimball, so I zoomed down there. Um, you look here, how many street trees do you see? Uh, hardly any, right? There, here's this, for those of you that are here with me, right behind where it says talking barb. Um, there's like, there's a street tree on a side road, right? A couple, but really where are the trees? Where are the trees? They're in the alleys, right? The trees are in the alleys. They're fallow, the most resilient trees. What are they? White mulberry. What else? Polonia. What else? Yeah. And then what's the other one? Atlantis. Atlantis. Some, yeah, plain, London plane trees usually, right? Not even sumacs. And Ilanthus altissima, right? So mm -hmm. tree of heaven. These are not native trees. These trees have low ecological value. Yes, they provide perching structure. Yes, a downy woodpecker could excavate a hole and eat out a living in the city. But we're not doing we're, we're not doing right by our uh, our birds or or just wildlife in general. If you imagine butterflies, right? A butter, butterflies could make it from pocket park to pocket park if there's a little bit of refugia. <clears throat> It's hard. We're such an impervious landscape, right? And a lot of these backyards where those trees are growing, they're rough. I rented in the city for 15 years. You know, you move into a spot, look at the backyard. Oh, shit, I, I, I can't do much with that, right? Old growth vines and a polonia tree. And like, there's not much you can do, right? And that's the other thing. There's not a lot of ownership. It's a lot of renting. It's like, who's going to manage this? Who's going to, you know, so... Um, you know, it's a it's a it's an uphill battle, right? And like, what are you going to see on the streets, right? This guy, definitely, right? This guy is the denizen of the urban landscape. But uh, you know, it is more resilient than that, right? We got morning doves and mockingbirds, downy woodpeckers. When I lived on Marco Street, just south of King Sesson, I watched a family of downy woodpeckers uh, every single morning. Now, granted, I'm I'm south of King Sesson between 46 and 47, 47 and 48. I'm close to the river and there's a hill slope down to the tracks before the river. So, you know, there's a little more natural area, but you know, you can get chickadees, you can get wrens and robins and cardinals. Um, if you're like Liam, you can sit on your balcony and get sandhill cranes, you know, like, so that's the, the amazing thing about our, our location is if you look up a, a lot of birding doesn't have to do with the landscape you're in, right? It's what's cruising above you. So on any given day, you can see some really cool stuff, even if you're in a highly impervious space. Our park systems, are like little pocket parks, this is again in South Philly. I think we're underutilizing this. We, we there, I think we need to get Parks and Rec, and look, Parks and Rec is killing it. I think they're doing an amazing job with uh, invasive species management in, in target areas. They're trying to really get to underserved communities and areas where there's just Riddled with the bases, we can't get in. A lot of their targets are those parts of Fairmount Park right now, which I applaud. I think it's great. Um, and we should be burning those locations too. Um, but, uh, you know, these pocket parks, how many times do you go visit a pocket park? And like a lot of the, the trees, you get some natives, right? There's some good old oaks that are 150 years old or whatever. And you can get good birds in migration, right? But like, what about the areas that were just mowing incessantly? And then the areas that were not mowing, it's just a monoculture of mugwort, you know? Um, so we could do better in these little spaces, get a couple more woodpeckers, get some more raptors, but this is also attracting cats, rats, dogs, heavy human use, so that the ecology changes kind of dramatically. And it's, right now it's still often a food desert, right? These are places where a bird can stop over but can't spend a ton of time. School campuses can be great. They can also really suck. This is Penn's more recent expansion where they have these fields down by the river. Um, almost all the landscaping they used here are native plants. It's pretty impressive, right? It's just thin lines of trees and like these little hill slopes. You can see those areas that don't look like mowed lawn, right? You got the two rectangle 
fields and the ball field, or is that shot put or whatever it is, some track and field stuff. But all these other areas, they've got native grasses in there. There's some native wildflowers. I've had really good birds here. You know, I've had the great pleasure of teaching ornithology as an adjunct at Penn since 2015. And I had a student, Max's wife, Chloe, who did a, a functional bird survey of Penn's campus. And we found killer birds down here. There's a nesting kestrel. Um, there's uh, in migration, we got cuckoos and just a whole suite of warblers. Really good. There's some decent stuff, brown thrasher. Um, and then uh, this is in the, the penny pack. This is a, owned by the city of Philadelphia, the one on the right. That's that farm school. What's the name of that? Fox Chase. Fox Chase. Yeah, thanks. You know, again, there's kestrel there. There's, there's really good birds. You can get great raptors in the sky, but the, the just subtle management, right? If they just manage those fields a little differently, they could support meadowlark and savannah sparrow every year through the breeding season. It's not happening right now, is it? Am I wrong? No, it's not. Right? They show up every now and again, and then they disappear in migration. That's it. They, they, they mow twice a year for because they need to supply the hay to the other farms. Right. So they, they supply the hay. But Fernando, the new farmer, is going to do uh, whatever that's called, pasture, right? So he's going to leave some stuff. Are you bringing cows to the landscape? Well, he has cows. They have cows. I know, but are they going to move them? They're moving them. This year is going to be. I'd love to talk to him. And I, by the way, sorry, this is another thing I wanted to mention up front. You know, I love this group. I this is there's a lot of peer pressure here because I care about you guys so much. You two and out there in the virtual world. Um, there's so many topics I would love to talk about. This isn't my strongest topic. Like I've been doing grassland bird research related to adaptive multi-paddock grazing with cattle. There's a four-part docuseries that's coming out soon. I'm in a, I'm in a movie, guys. Hey. Um, but like it's meaningful stuff. We're publishing a paper in the Journal of Environmental Management. And like, and then I'm also doing research with regenerative agriculture. This is all to save grassland birds. It's bigger than Philly, but it's a topic that's exciting. And I want to share that with you guys. So you guys got to invite me back to do a, a, a more exciting presentation. <laughs> if you guys don't mind, sometime later in the year or something. The, uh, make sure they have a link to your trailer for the... Yeah, yeah. If, we, if I don't totally exhaust everyone's time and, and mental capacity... With my ramblings, we can maybe even play it real quick before I split. It's a three-minute trailer. Um, but anyway, like, that's an example of how management, like, the removal of some of those tree lines, right? Just some subtle management. And if we cycled cattle through and we gave, I don't think it's big enough to give 60 days of rest. But it depends. On, Fernando would have to be real aggressive with the approach to move, to move the paddocks, which is doable, right? I'd love to talk to him and try and empower that um, and share some resources for him, you know? <clears throat> Um, uh, but, uh, anyway, yeah, there's, there's room, there's room to, to, to store <coughs> spaces more so than we already are. I think camp, again, this is just a double down on that. A lot of planted conifers, native or not, are going to support shipping sparrows and American goldfinches. Um, you can get big days in migration on these campuses. Like, go, you know, if, if, you know, all of us should be birding in May, right? May is just such a sweet time and we all just want to go to, and what's that? April. And April, yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, and, uh, you know, we all want to go rush to Cape May and all these other killer places, and we should, but we should take some time to bird in our backyard, too. Um, and think about, don't just do an eBird list and then forget about it, or just take that one cool picture and post it on Facebook and be a star for the day, right? Like, think about what it means. I, that's, my, that's my Wednesday morning to walk. Oh, okay, great. Right? So we walk, if you look at the top top right corner of the fox chase farm yeah we're coming out of the woods and then we're making that loop and we're kind of going the fence line there cool and we do it eight weeks in a row that's so great see different so stuff. and how many years have you been doing that uh, five probably can we compile those data to see what's showing up and not sticking around that should stick around how many american red stars are breeding in those woods any how many wood thrush nests? There should be some. No, there's tons of yeah, them. right. So wood thrush, but what about you know Scarlet Tanager, American Red Star, Ovenbird, you know, like, and I guarantee just thinking strategically, like, wow, if we if we got our hands on thirty, you know, two gallon trees and planted them in this area and protected them from deer, I bet within five years we could get a, a red star to nest here. And it sounds simple. It sounds maybe dumb, right, to like plan around one nesting territory, but it's not. 
And if you get that, if that bird shows up, that's an indicator of things happening that are much greater than just that bird nesting there. So, but like that level of intimate data within a landscape, you're birding an area for years, and you see things showing up in migration, and then it goes silent in the in the in the summer. But we're in the geographic historic range for that species. Like, what's missing? What's missing in the landscape? That's actionable conservation goals right there. You know, and I think we uh, collectively as a group are able to inform folks that will listen when it comes to those sorts of, uh, you know, adaptive management goals, right? Um, this is another one when we think about this, like, you know, to the right, you're looking at the woodlands and the biopond, a little postage stamp that's closed canopy. Uh, you make a great day bird in those two locations, you know, spring, summer, fall, even winter. Like you can get some really good birds over there. This other one, this is Temple's campus. Temple's campus is highly urbanized. There's hardly any green spaces. And where there are green spaces, there's not native plantings. There's not, there's not a lot of investment. And I would argue that if we have, if I had just 20 units to spend, right, whatever that is, on ecological restoration, and I had to look at these two places, I would invest probably all of them on Temple's campus to find little places to think about at the soil level, at the microbe level, at the insect level, and at one or two breeding bird territory level, ways to improve this landscape. It's there's more people that it can touch, right? The more you're going to change the soundscape for people waking up and walking down the street here, and there's there's more educational opportunities. And in these areas where we have a desert, right, with this paucity of habitat, it might be critically important for a couple birds, right, or a, or a butterfly that's trying to make it that year. So. Um, you know, we need to think about these things and not just, what, what do they say? Not keep things as pristine and profane, right? We can't just write off these highly urbanized and, and areas that are awash with impervious surfaces as not worth investing in. And I would argue that we need to think more critically since, you know, 85% of our city looks like that, you know? Um, the airports are always killer, right? Liam's a legend documenting breeding horned lark and all these other things up in the Northeast. Um, and can anybody tell me what's wrong with this picture? Yeah. What's that? Well, you know, a lot of grassland birds love to perch in a nearby something to, to you know, project. All right, um, spoiler alert, this is a Western, a Western. Meadow, like, yeah, yeah, this is a Western. <laughs> uh, this photo, I took this photo somewhere in, in my travels and do, doing my grassland bird research out, out West. Uh, I don't have a good photo of an Eastern Meadow Lark. Really, shame on me. Right? But maybe shame on us. We should be creating functional breeding bird habitat. Here's the thing about airports. So I'm an FAA qualified airport wildlife biologist. I take everything I know about ecology and creating landscapes, and I use it to to create deserts close to runways. You know why? Because all how many of us have never been on a plane before? All right, everyone here has been on a plane. Probably every, almost every loved one you know has been on a plane. Planes can hold 270 people. If an air, if an airfield is mismanaged, it's a plane can easily go down by sucking in one Canada goose or 30 European starlings. 270 people die. Right, that affects 270 families. That's an important thing. We use air travel currently. In fact, this becomes even more important when you're doing research in Hawaii, right, a remote island archipelago where in less you're on a boat, like you rely regularly, daily. People take da multiple daily flights. So I think it's important that we manage these spaces to be safe for flight. However, the, the, without going too deep into the to that world, um, the, the big issues for flight safety are big birds, flocking birds, and big flocking birds, right? So <laughs> you don't want to promote habitat for big flocking birds like Nene or Canada Goose or make some killer duck pond at the end of a runway. <laughs> However, you could create killer grassland bird habitat for savanna sparrows and grasshopper sparrows and these species that don't tend to congregate in huge numbers, right? There's a grass height that if you make it just too tall, European uh, starlings and blackbirds in migration won't land and forage in it because their lookouts can't get tall enough and look out, right? So it becomes unsafe for them to land so they won't aggregate in the fall uh, or late summer, more importantly. 
Um, so there's ways to manage these habitats where they're actually really good grassland bird habitat and you're supporting species that are not big and don't flock, right? So again, there's some missed opportunities at both of both of the major airports in our in our region. Um, and then we do have killer meadows, Dixon, Zandora, Houston Meadow. Uh, the, I love the small meadow of Barchers Garden. It pulls in savannah spires and stuff in migration, which is killer because it's just a postage stamp. So, you know, any any little space um, that, but like, you know, Houston Meadow, it's 100% switchgrass pretty much, right? There's, there, it's, there's a low ecological value as far as grasslands go, right? And we've talked, I've talked to folks up there about that. Like, you know, there's, there's, we should be, strategically killing some switchgrass and planting wildflowers and like di diversifying the structure within that space. Maybe it's not gonna be the best thing for grassland birds, but it could be killer for butterflies, dragonflies, you know, a, a whole, you know, uh, toads and other, other wildlife, right? So, um, I saw you the day I took this photograph. I, I yeah. have the same photo. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> this is a penny pad. Here's a classic example of a Philadelphia birding day, right? Old growth English ivy climbing up a, a once native tree that's been killed by the ivy uh, with an amazing bird hiding in it. So, you know, Fairmount Park, it's we have an amazing mature hardwood forest community, right? We got a lot of really good trees, a lot of good oaks, a lot of good hickories, beech forests, right? You know, um, a lot of good American mass producing trees that have huge wildlife value. But underneath is shit, part of my language, right? We have old growth Lanicera macchiae, you know, uh, honeysuckle. Um, and uh, I mean, most of the shrubs, most of the vines, uh, and most of the forbs are non native, right? And, uh, you know, I don't have to explain it to you guys. It's, it's painfully diverse or uh, simplified in these historically really diverse areas. You know, walking past that passenger pigeon display. Right, it's Arisema trifilum, and uh, you know, probably they're probably trying to do two different Solomon seal, both false and, and true Solomon seal. Mitchell repens, and you know, like there's a bunch of native plants that used to occur, you know, Eurybias and Symbioticums and Solidagos that were missing in the landscape, both the forested and the open edges and, and open meadows. And you know, deer management is a part of that, right? Or, or too much herbivory for mammals. Um, uh, but uh, really it's the invasive plants and invasive plant management. And uh, there are champions at Philadelphia Parks and Rec and with the native plant nursery, Max, and uh, the folks that he hires on a seasonal basis to work with him that are doing good work. And like my company, we've been lucky enough to, to help, you know, kill invasives. And, and usually often with projects, we'll eradicate invasives and then plant new plants and steward that space thereafter. But with Philly Parks and Rec, because we have a native plant nursery, we typically just kill the invasives and then they come in and plant stuff and put, put some fences up or whatever. But, you know, it's working, but there's so much more. And I think we, again, could help prioritize, right? We could help look at the map. There's only a limited amount of resources every year, but, you know, for the long haul, we could lay out a framework for 20 years that might cover 80% of Fairmount Park with, you know, thoughtful, meaningful implementation, restoring that structure. You know, we have just old trees. There's no, the, the, you know, once those trees age out, we're, we're in for some trouble, right? Because we don't have tree regeneration because of herbivory and all these other reasons. So um, we have this great resource, but we need to think about the future. Here's the, so I was lucky enough to do bird research and a bunch of, uh, uh, and my team did a, a bunch of planting at Longwood Gardens when Route 52 was rerouted. They put up these mat, we put up these massive deer exclusion fences. And I don't know how well you can tell, but on the left there, you're looking on the, the left pit, left image, left side of the left image is outside of the deer exclusion fence. On the right side is inside, and that's without planting, right? And we did do some planting here, but this area specifically was just like left to its own devices. There's seven different native tree species growing there, and native shrubs and native wildflowers that are growing underneath there. Now, granted, we're surgically going through and killing every Celastris that pops up too, right? I mean, it takes active stewardship. You can't just put a fence up and walk away and magic happens. But it's astounding what just removing deer pressure in, in these eastern forests can do. And then to the right, there is another photo. Some of those trees are planted, some are volunteered, 
right? There's volunteer uh, liridendron tulipifera and a bunch of other great trees. That's critical habitat. I mean, we got orchard orioles and, um, oh man, we had a whole suite of birds nesting there. And the, uh, I don't have an image of it, but uh, there's a big exposure that's sort of shrub scrubbish where we planted a lot of uh, white pine um, along with oaks and some other things. Uh, with Well, first we, we seeded the whole area. It was an old hay field. It's on the, on the right side if you're heading north on Route 52. No public access to it. I had the great pleasure of being one of the few people with a key to it. And I did bird surveys in there. And we had two, not just one, but two clay-colored sparrows countersinging in young pine trees in this area. And there were, I, I had to stop every, I had to come back and survey the next day because right then I ruined the rest of the morning. I just stopped, right? And I watched them. And one was actively trying to build a nest. And there was a song sparrow that hated it and was a total dick and was harassing him while he's trying to build the nest. I reached out to Holly Merker, who's a the Chester County compiler. And she's like, yeah, in her beautiful, like sort of not so way, was like, yeah, it's kind of significant. Like the last time there was nesting evidence in Chester County of clay colored sparrow was like 100, 100 some years ago, right? I said it all not so long, but just like, bah. no, they didn't, <laughs> they didn't stick around, but they tried, right? So like, Again, like the you know the possibilities, right? Um, I love this, right? I'm not gonna. This will be the last thing I think I will say about uh, about deer, but um, Otto Leopold is one of my favorite um, authors. Just as a deer herd lives in mortal fear, mortal fear of its wolves, so does a mountain live in mortal fear of its deer, and perhaps with better cause. For while a buck pulled down by wolves can be replaced in two or three years. A range pulled down by too many deer may fail of replacement in as many decades. And it's true. And every time we, you know, the, 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 our inaction is resulting in multi-decadal issues. So, you know, I, I just whatever. You get it. Cemeteries. I had the great pleasure of working at uh, Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn to do bird surveys, killer birds, the magic trees, right? They had one place they called the magic tree. And I'm like, whatever, you know, you talk to some Brooklyn birders and they're amazing birders. And they're like, trust me, that tree is magic. Well, May 23rd, I had literally 17 species of warbler in this one freaking oak tree. It's like, yeah, how does that happen? But like, a but similar scenario, mowed lawn underneath, but it's an arboretum, killer trees, like long, like Laurel Hill, right? Um, you know, just beautiful, beautiful, amazing tree specimens with a lot of mowed lawn underneath. A lot of it needs to stay mowed, right? So people can access and visit their loved ones, places of rest. But especially at Greenwood, there's some areas that nobody visits, right? And like, there's the, the stewardship has gone fallow. So they're like, okay, like maybe we can convert this to a warm season grass. And like, you know, we can't mow it. We got to come in with weed whackers because there's, there's tombstones from the 1800s that are peppered in there. Well, they, you know, they're supporting bobolinks in mass and in, in migration in Brooklyn, right? So it's pretty amazing what you can do in these spaces. Laurel Hill Cemetery is, is championing that right now. They, they just invested in this project. I don't know. How, I'm probably already too long. How much time we have left? Not much. Right. Any? Six minutes. Six minutes. Debbie Fresh. All right. So um, I probably won't talk too much about it, but uh, how many of you have driven on Kelly Drive and you see what looks like a big diaper on the hill slope? <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's eradication of English ivy, mugwort, a bunch of other things, but most importantly, the English ivy that has been simplifying that landscape forever, right? For, for a long, long time. Underneath that are rock outcrops of Wissahickon schist and nice, is one billion year old rock that had lithophilic plants like wild columbine and all this amazing stuff growing on it, interspersed with the amazing hardwood forest community. Dramatic killer looks over the, over the Schuylkill and over into the burbs. And you know, it's just, the, the place is amazing. We killed, we killed off that stuff. We used chemical, we used herbicide to kill the, the um, uh, invasives. We then uh, sprayed some, some mulch to put some, a little bit of soil down. And by the way, it was Larry Wiener and Associates that designed this. My company just implemented it. Often we'll do the design and the build and the maintenance for this particular project. Larry Wiener Associates, which are amazing, by the way, if you don't know them, they're an amazing group here in Philly. They designed the, the plant palette and the whole process so it was like the spraying of some soil. Um, and uh, I think, I don't know if it was hydro seeded, if we, if we had the native plant seed within that or, 
but we hand shoot it uh, afterwards. And then there's some silt socks. And then that's that's a coconut fiber. That's a, a, a e-matting, erosion control. So, and if you, I drove past it, it was yesterday, there's some areas where you're starting to see some green pushing through. It's gonna take a little while before that looks like a killer meadow, two, three years, you know? But uh, some things will flower this year and it'll green up. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the type of things that we can do. Here's a little pocket in my front yard. You could do this in any West Philly front yard. And I mean, even in the Northeast where you got a posted stamp for a front yard, it could look like that. You could support a ton of uh, native critters and you do that good work for your soil just by enjoying plants, right? Um, and so the, again, pocket parks, industrial areas, the park system, the open water stuff I could go on forever about. We're, right now we're trying to get permitted the first ever freshwater tidal wetland restoration project along the city of Philadelphia in the river, right? So in between um, the uh, the piers by Walmart, there's four piers, the, the fishing pier, which is like all concrete, the pier below it, and the two piers above it, that whole space, we've been working now for two and a half years, working with NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, PA Fish and Boat Commission, DEP, Philadelphia Water Department doing robust studies, and it's looking like we this may be a pilot for for what hopefully will be more ecological restoration, tidal wetland restoration, mud flats, and creating all this, some rad stuff. So um, hopefully that'll be a killer birding destination, which you know reaches you know only seventy thousand people in South Philly, but you know it's reasonably accessible to. Um, here's some plant species. That, how many of you know Doug Tallamy? Doug Tallamy, amazing, right? So this is directly from his spreadsheets. Just the genus of oaks support at a minimum 534 Lepidopteran species, right? So, um, you know, if we had a longer time to chat, like we could go on and on about how many of these are really important within our landscape and within each physiographic province too. We, because we have the fall line right in the city, we can plant really diverse plant communities that were historically present within the city, which is kind of amazing. Um, which have great value um, for different critters. Um, and then here's some understory trees and shrubs that I recommend this, like, you know, if you're gonna do some planting in your yard, select these things, you know? Um, and then here's some uh, some uh, wildflowers, some forb species. Again, at the genus level, you know, Solidago, you can tell it's old, it says Aster, but it's Symbiotricum. You know, but like, you know, there's, with each one of these, there's multiple species that are relevant to our area and if you go on, I mean, you're familiar with the USDA plants website, good, right? If you're not, use this, right? If, you're, if you, you see something you think is cool, check and see if it's native to your county. You can zoom right in and look and see if it's native to the county. Uh, this is, I'm just going to blaze right through this, forget all this. But this is, you know, here's the existing conditions, right? Steep slope overlooking Kelly Drive. Look at all that ivy, right? And there's gorgeous trees. And then there's a little, there's roofs, right? There's some sumac. We saved all the sumac. We didn't kill one sumac, just these invasive yeah. of, of uh, ivy and stuff. And like here, you can see like there's some great sumac there, but also the ivy. Here's the design for the whole thing. Design precedents. Here's some cool upland mixed hardwood forest and native upland river associated meadow habitats, blah, blah, blah. Like we come up with ecological justifications for what our goals are. Plant selection. Here's my guys tied in up top. We had to delay in and stuff because it's steep slopes and you're gonna get run over if you fall into Kelly Drive. It's a guarantee. Um, and uh, you know, this is phase one, right? This is the area that we did. So along on either side of Hunting Ab, uh, on, along Kelly Drive, here's some of the design specs, blah, blah, blah. And like, whoops, you know, here you can see some of the finished product. And like, it, like right here, you can see this is all brown. This was all ivy. Here there was, uh, um, a Ridgeron and a couple native plants, right? There's some trying to scan the Ohio entrance. So I'm like, guys, don't fire hose this. Be very surgical with your invasive species management. Yeah. yet. So you're doing carryover Kelly Drive to the riverbend side at all? Or? No, that's not, that's not the cemetery's property. It'd be great too, right? I mean, that's a conversation we should have with the city, right? So now it looks like this, like it's all diapered up, but trust me, it's gonna, this is gonna look killer. We did some ecological monitoring, right? So, uh, and so not a lot of money, but we wanted to have something, right? So we could, what are some indicators of success? We couldn't do a full insect study. They're very costly and you have to come out multiple times with multiple methodologies, literally every month of the year. 
So instead, you know, we consulted with a research entomologist and we're like, basically, what's like the most streamlined thing you could do and maybe get some meaningful data? And then obviously we're going to do birds, right? Um, and he was like, uh, look at Hymenoptera, right? Do some bee bowls and some, some sweeps and just repeat that, you know, each year, you know, pre, during, and post-construction. So we found 12 species of Hymenoptera. We shared the bycatch with other scientists. So those things are identified, flower flies and, and other species that aren't within the, our target taxa. We didn't just throw them out, right? Um, and there's some cool stuff, right? There's kleptoparasitic wasps and, you know, some cool stuff. Um, and you can see me standing there, set up a bee bowl in just a monoculture of uh, English ivy. And, you know, with six points, we got 45 species doing uh, 18 of which we confirmed breeding on the site. Mostly generalist passerine, but, you know, the, the great cat birds are loving that sumac. And uh, look at the, this, this male uh, Baltimore Oriole. You know, the, the, the intensity of orange within their coats is an indicator of fitness. This guy's looking pretty pale, not terribly sexy, if I may say so. Um, so, you know, I, I, there's no, we've been catching them color banned, and so we won't know. But uh, I hope in two or three years, if this bird's still alive and holding out of territory here, he's going to be a little more orange because he's going to have more food, right? We're, we're not increasing the acreage of suitable habitat, but we're increasing the quality of the habitat. There's more food resources uh, within the space. So that's it. And uh, that, whatever, you can ignore that. That's it. Thanks for letting me ramble on. Um, I would love to entertain them. I can sit around for the folks that are here. Maybe we offer the folks on, on the, that are digital first if there's any questions.